Anybody else who wants to share some news with us? I want to congratulate Stephen. Yeah, Stephen Rowland and his Jordan Bulldogs for the win. Thanks, Stephen. Right. Hey, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know, did you? You knew. Okay. Lee, yeah, that was good. you want to share something with us today? My daughter is in Sarah's paradise. It took her like 11 hours to get from there to here. She back way up here and lost everything. It took her the same amount of time to get back there. Everybody's got a gas and good food. Um, and she is, I'm fixing a therapist, but she works with a lot of patients. And so she is, is, is devastating. Her fiance has a strawberry farm, or he did have a strawberry farm in Plant City, which was decimated. And he had just planted 70,000 strawberry plants where he took the other tiny. Mm. So we can expect either no strawberries this year or really, really expensive strawberries. So I, Tim and I had thought about something we could do and help folks down there. And Tim, do you want to come? Yeah, you know, in lieu of the 50-50, the Queen of Hearts, we're going to ask you all to donate money through Patty. Uh, we will make a, uh, a uh, combined contribution through the district uh, to those families and others who have been devastated by this hurricane. You know, we did this for Helene a couple of weeks ago. You all were very generous. We sent a few hundred dollars uh, from the club. This is our opportunity again to help people that, whose lives have been impacted. You know, we dodged a bullet here in Jacksonville, uh, but there are many places throughout the state and beyond who did not dodge this bullet. Lives have really been destroyed and they're trying to get their lives back together again. So we're gonna send a contribution through the district uh, to those who have been impacted by uh, this awful hurricane. And in lieu of the 50-50, Make your contribution via Patty, and we'll send one big check uh, uh, to the district. All right? Okay, there's no uh, lunch meeting next week. It is our service week, and obviously it's a great time for us to give service to those who have been impacted by this recent storm in our community. I'd ask you to do that. I'd also want to remind you that next Wednesday evening is the board meeting. Our board meetings are held in my office, 1 West Adams, downtown. We meet from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Um, obviously, all of our officers and uh, area directors are expected to be there, but anyone is welcome. And the good news is we end the meeting with booze. So it's a great meeting. Um, <laughs> Hope you can arrive and, uh, and join us. You can also attend via Zoom. There is a way that you can do it uh, via Zoom. But you All right. Get food. You don't get the food. I, you know, if, if you call Doritos and, um, you know, Cheez-Its and Hostess Twinkies food, yeah, <laughs> there'll be some food. But there'll definitely be beer and wine. <laughs> Family of Rotary Report. Uh, I know I saw Palmer Bell. Palmer. Come on up here and tell everybody how we're doing. We got a few birthdays this month, you heard mention. All right, uh, Lee's reminder about people affected by the hurricane uh, goes way beyond Florida. So I love the fact that we're, we're going to do something looking broader. I have a son and daughter in law, and two of our grandkids live in Asheville. They uh, just got power on Sunday, and they got water, kind of. It's really mud that they're pumping through the system right now. So you can't use it, but they need you to use it. So go figure. I don't know how they're going to get it out of there, but it's, it's a bad scene. So put that together with Milton and everything that's going on in mid-southern Florida. Uh, Tornado damage. I had a friend who a tornado went right through their backyard during Milton. Didn't touch any of the houses either side. So there are blessings in the middle of tragedy as well. So got to keep the balance in there somehow. Um, this week, um, William Milney finished his transition to Global Mortgage. He's got new contact information. So if you haven't seen that, he's 
uh, happy to get you that kind of information. Uh, Ike Sherlock, beautiful picture of Ike, who's a championship golfer from the business. He was named one of the. Are we? Are we? Are we congratulating him, his looks or his golf? <laughs> yes. Both. both of those, plus the Business Journal uh, Ultimate CEO. Um, I saw that. He's one of 11 or 12 that they they uh, named. So congratulations on that. Are there other family of rotary kinds of? Jimmy? I'm going to sit. I'm still took a fall the other day and my butt still hurts. But anyway, and, uh, I'm delighted to have with me today my daughter, Laura Kelly. Many of you know her, um, but she is uh, my only child, and she's been having some health issues over the last several months, but she was well enough she wanted to come see Rob today, All right. and we're delighted to have her. Thank you. As your dad probably told you, there have been any number of times your name has been mentioned here for <laughs> prayers and thoughts, so I appreciate glad it. you're well enough to be here. Uh, birthdays this week, uh, well, not exactly this week, but we're not going to be here next week. So Stanley Cantor on the 19th, uh, Susan Black on the 20th, Ike, that's a threefer, I guess he's champion, uh, Rotarian of the week. Uh, his birthday's on the 22nd, and I guess we'll pick up all the rest that last week in October. Uh, if uh, you may have, I mean, if you're in interested in the symphony at all, you know uh, that uh, Mr. Lewis is is hired as director there of, of music, but you probably don't know that in this short time in Jacksonville, he's been hit by lightning three times. Mm, three times. Three times. Wow. He's a good conductor. <laughs> Uh, that wasn't bad, guys. <laughs> no. Palmer Bell, thank you so much. So uh, now's the time when we're going to introduce Jeff, the visiting notarian. Joseph Brigger, could you do that for us? I'll be glad to do Thank you. Yeah, I tell you, I'm not going to try to follow that joke in any way, shape, or form. You can't win from that. Well, Jimmy's already introduced his daughter, Laura, and around the table we do have, and let me put these on, Kathleen MacArthur, Joe Wolf, and Rob Kelly, our speakers for the day. We appreciate y'all being with us. I, Forfer, you have a guest with you also? My guest today is Kevin Lee. Kevin's a commercial realtor from Fifty uh, Hollywoods. He's uh, in the space, space all over town. Ted Lombard, you have someone with you? Yeah, good friend of mine. I've known Paul over 30 years. He owns insurance wagon here in Jacksonville. Thank all right, you. great. Thank you. Jerry, I brought on a slide you, Jerry Kelly from the district level of Rotary. We always appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right on. It's Oh, I do want to say something. After many years of dealing with this, Tim Carla replaced the gooseneck. Look, it stays where you leave. Oh, thank you. But does it work? <laughs> it does work. <laughs> Y'all should expect an increase in your dues next month. <laughs> All right, now is the time we've been waiting for the introduction of our speaker. Uh, Jimmy Kelly, past president Jimmy Kelly. Uh, you gonna do it from there? Yeah, I'm gonna do it from here. I am gonna do it. All right. Is it working? It's on. Yes, it is. You're good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to introduce to you today, Rob Kelly. He's the CEO of Reed USA. Um, our club has been very instrumental in uh, literacy and youth for many, many years. Thought it would be a great idea to have Rob come in here and talk about that. Uh, he was raised, he was born and raised here locally, went to UNF, and then got his master's at Nova Southeast. And then he was accepted at the Ohio State University. <laughs> Took everything out of me to say that. Um, <laughs> with a doctoral degree. And that's led him through numerous jobs, but put him in, in his present position. 
Um, he's totally committed to this initiative. I've watched him grow since he was an infant. He's uh, pres presently, he's the literary chair for the Florida Literary Association. And in the past, he was volunteer, he was uh, for the Duval County Literary Association. Both organizations are fully volunteer uh, at nonprofits and they ed uplift educators in our community. Um, his major, uh, major funding sources are corporate, individual, and then some government, which you'll speak to. Um, I'm pleased and please welcome him with a warm West Jacksonville Rotary welcome to my cousin, Dr. Rob Kelly. Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. Glad to be here representing Read USA. So I'll tell you a little bit about Read USA and then uh, tell you I want to talk. Well, first, I'm going to talk about a, a literacy problem that we have here in the district, and I'll tell you about Read USA. Um, you know, reading is at the forefront of anything you want to do. I don't care what job you have. My dad worked for WW Game Mechanical for 47 years. And as a plumber, and guess what? He needed to know how to read, right? So reading is important to success in life. And it's not only important to success, but it's important because we know that if you learn to read well, that you have better health outcomes, you're less likely to have encounters with the criminal justice system, and you're most more likely to have a more successful job. So reading is not just something that kids do in school, it's something that's vital to our community, but, but we, have, we have, the issue is, is that we have a very high percentage of kids not reading on grade level. And it's very easy to point fingers and say, oh, there's teachers, oh, there's schools, whatever. But the, the problem is, is that if those kids continue on, they're going to be the ones at your doorstep wanting a job, and they're not going to have the skills, the reading skills, the comprehension skills that they need to be successful in life. So Read USA is a nonprofit aimed at solving that problem. We know that right now our public schools, and I see Dr. Ed Pratt Daniels here. We were together earlier this morning, our former superintendent. Mm -hmm. it, you know, our public schools, they are they're they they need a lot of support right now. We've got budget shortfalls, we've got teacher shortages, things like that. So we've got to come together and help build the capacity in the school systems so it so that we can have a successful community going forward. And that's what Read USA does. So Read USA, we are we are here to solve a problem. My board chair we hired me. She said, "If you do your job right, we'll be closing our doors. Meaning, if you solve this problem, we won't need this organization anymore. So we're here to solve a problem, not sustain an organization." And do I need to wait a minute for? Or can you? Oh, uh, you're good to go. You can. Yeah. yeah. Do I get a next slide? Yep. Thank you. I thought you were going to do that. That's okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm a former teacher. That's okay. We'll make it work. There you go. Oh, there it is. There it is. Okay. So, so we're here to solve a problem, and we're, we're here to do it in a couple of different ways. So as you can see, when you have 50%, about 50% of kids in Florida at the third grade not reading on grade level, half of our kids sitting in third grade right now are not reading on grade level. Now let's think about this. Do you think that gets better as they move up the grades or do you think that gets worse? Well, if we do nothing about it, it gets worse, right? But as it sits right now, we have, we have about 50% of our kids that need extra intervention in reading. In addition to that, we have about 
uh, and this this uh, isn't up here, but we, about 70% of kids that are reading below grade level have zero books at home. There's another issue. How are you expected to get good at something if you don't have the tools to practice it, right? So you can see how very quickly this problem of low literacy or illiteracy compounds. We've got kids that are falling behind. The schools don't have the capacity to give the extra support that they need. And when the kids go home, they don't have the tools they need at home to practice these skills that they are lacking. So Read USA, that's what we do. We try to, we are here to put books in kids' hands that they want to read. That's the tools that they need to practice, right? And then we're here to provide tutoring to those children to help bring them up to grade level reading. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about that today, and but just keep in mind that we're here to solve a problem. There's an, it's an issue that needs to be addressed and that's what we're working to do, along with a lot of other partners in the community, our largest partner being Duval County Public Schools. We were started, you know, on the next one. We were started, on the next one. Back in 2011, by a local philanthropist and a classroom teacher. In 2011, Ellen Wiss, working, she was volunteering with Junior League. She went to George Washington Carver Elementary, which right now is one of the, has one of the highest poverty levels of all the elementary schools in Duval County, over on 45th Street. She went in there to volunteer and she walked into Vanessa Tussie's classroom, who was a fourth grade teacher, and she saw two things. One thing was, is she saw that the kids in that classroom were engaged. That, let me say that again. If you've not been in school for a while, these were fourth graders and they were engaged, okay? So something was different about this classroom than other classrooms that Ellen had seen. And the other thing was, is that this teacher was trying to do extra pieces for her kids that she had not seen other teachers do. Like she was asking kids, what kinds of books do you like to read? That's a good question, isn't it? Can you imagine, does anybody go to Barnes and Noble in here or bookstores like that? Anybody? Okay. Can you imagine if you walked in the door of Barnes and Noble and someone greeted you and said, hello, welcome to Barnes and Noble. And they didn't ask you if you needed any help. They said, um, you'll be going over here to the history section today. Um, enjoy the history section. And you go, but that's not what I came here for. Well, that's what we're sending you over here to the history section, right? Hello, welcome to Barnes and Noble. You'll be going over here to romance, right? In essence, that's what we're doing with kids when we don't give them choice of the books they want to read. We're saying, here's the story for today. And everybody's going to read this story and everybody's going to love this story. Well, guess what? That, they don't all like to read that story. And I get it. There's There's got to be opportunity for practice where it's, you say, well, they can't always have choice. That's not real life. I, you're right, but they need some, right? So this teacher recognized that, that there's something about choice, but there's also something about this engagement and getting the, the buy-in from the kids. So Ellen, with that teacher, with that teacher inspiration there, Ellen created Read USA. And for the first time ever, what Ellen, what uh, George Washington Carver had was, is a book fair. Anybody remember scholastic book fairs? Yeah. You know what? Every time I ask that, people say yes, and people smile when they say yes. Because there's something about walking in and getting to choose books that people are like, yeah, that, I remember that, right? This school, George Washington Carver Elementary, had never had a book fair. You know why? No money. No money. When you go to a book fair, what do you got to have? You got to have some money. Am I standing too close to that? No, you're perfect. Okay. You've got to have money. And so this, remember I said this is one of the, the most impoverished areas in Jacksonville, the highest uh, poverty rate in, in of any school in Jacksonville. So the kids, if they don't have money, Scholastic's not going to send a book fair there because they're not going to make any money, right? So they never had a book fair. So Ellen, 
she has money, she's a philanthropist. She said, I'll pay for the book fair. Bring the book fair to the school. I'll pay for the book fair. Tell every kid they can choose three free books. So she had every kid in that school come to the book fair, walk into that book fair and select three free books and they got to write their name in it and take them home. So that's how Read USA got started. To this day, we still do that. We are now up to serving all 100 elementary schools in Duval County Public Schools. Every spring, we have book fairs in all 100 elementary schools in Duval County, and every kid, all 51,000 plus children in Duval County, walk through these book fairs and get to select books, write their names, and take them home. Because book choice matters and because children need tools at home to practice this really important skill that, that we know is important to our future. But having the books at home isn't enough, right? It's kind of like having an, an exercise bike at home, but you don't use it. Or you may, maybe you don't know how to use it properly, right? You've got to have some instruction to go along with that. And that's the other half of what we do is now you have these books that you want to read. Let's teach you how to read them and teach you how to read them well, not just call the words. Let's understand and talk about what these books mean. And so from one interaction, that's how this organization started. And here we are uh, 14, almost 14 years later, and now we're serving thousands and thousands of kids every year. So let me tell you just a little bit about some of the recent impact we've had, because I'll tell you, I was a classroom teacher here in Duval County for many years. I worked at the district office and in, in elementary literacy, and I've taught teachers to teach children how to read. The data matters. If what we're doing doesn't show an impact on kids reading progress, then what we're doing isn't enough. It would just be like in your businesses, right? If what you were doing didn't impact the customer or the bottom line, then it, it's not whatever you're doing isn't enough. So we rely on external evaluators every semester to come in and look at the data that we have to say, Read USA, you're spending all this money that people are donating to you, and you say you're doing good things in the community. How do we know? What's the return on this investment? So I want to share a little bit of that with you. So one of the things I told you, I've already told you about the book events that we do, and we one of the partnerships that we have that I, that's really fun to talk about is with the Jacksonville Jaguars. So you may not have known this, but the Jacksonville Jaguars, with every major partner that comes to this city and partners with the Jaguars, for instance, like Florida Blue or Gallagher uh, Insurance Company, the, the Jaguars ask them to make a percentage of their donation to the Jaguars, a percentage of that goes to education. And so we are one of the organizations that benefit from that percentage of education donation. And years ago, the Jaguars invented something called literacy locker room. And so what they did is they said, you know, we have these football players here and cheerleaders and Jackson DeVille. Wouldn't it be cool if we could go to a school and provide books for kids and have one of these big football players up here reading a book to the kids? Wouldn't that send a good message? So that's what we do. So we just had a literacy locker room at John Love Elementary over off 8th Street. We're about to have another one at Beauclair Elementary over in near the Mandarin area, Bay Matters area. And so the kids love it. We, we, put, we bring in, them into an assembly. The player come in. Jackson DeVille comes in. The Roar comes in. Everybody comes in. And it's amazing to watch these kids listen to a football player read a children's book to them and talk about how reading is important to their job. So that's one of the partnerships we have with our books in addition to the book fairs that we do. 
uh, you can see that uh, to date, we've given out almost 900,000 books and we've reached uh, almost 330,000 kids. In 2025, we expect to hit, hit the million bookmark. So we're really excited about that, that we've given almost a million books away to kids in Jacksonville. One of the other things that we have is our, our multicultural literacy programming. And when I say multicultural, a lot of people go, what does that mean? Well, here's what that means. What that means is, is that we are in, in invested and interested in books, not only that kids want to read, but books that have people in the books that look like the kids that are reading them and experiences in the books that represent experiences that kids are familiar with. We have a, a growing population in this city of English language learners. And there are certain schools that we're working in where a very high percentage of the kids uh, going to that school, their families don't speak English. They're learning English as another language. And so we want to make sure that we're providing books to those families and to the kids that have people and, ex and uh, cultural experiences in there that they're familiar with. But something else that's important is, is we want to make sure that the books that kids are reading, at least some of them, represent the culture here. And I don't just mean in the US, I mean here, Jacksonville. I remember being that first grade teacher and we had social studies standards. Dr. PD, do you remember that when we had social studies standards? I think we still do, but nobody talks about them anymore, right? But we had social studies standards and in first grade, here's what the social studies standards talked about. You had to teach kids about local geography, local jobs and local leaders. That, that's part of the uh, curriculum. Well, we didn't have a lot of tools to teach young children about those things. So what we did in starting in 2022, Read USA, we started publishing a children's book every month. We're up to three years. December will be three years now, meaning we have 36 volumes uh, published. And each volume, you can see Darnell Smith here on that volume there and on Jeremy's journey. Each volume, we interview a local leader. And those books are, they're children's books. They're, they're, they're uh, illustrated really colorfully. They have photographs of local places here in the city and of the person we're interviewing. And it tells their story in a kid-friendly way and introduces them to a local leader, a local job, and local geography. So teachers in, in the classroom are now able to access these books, and through reading, they are accessing the social studies standards, and kids are learning about the treasures that we have here in Jacksonville. Another thing that we have is teacher professional development. So we talked about the book side of it. Remember we said those are the tools that kids need. Got to have the tools to practice reading. But you also have to have some instruction. Reading doesn't come naturally. That's not something that's natural. We ought to learn how to do that. And so one of the things that we do, Read USA offers teacher professional development. Now remember I said we are partnering hand in hand with the school district. But right now, you might say, well, why didn't the school district handle that? They do. They just can't handle all of it. Why? Because remember we said there's budget cuts, teacher shortfalls, all those kinds of things right now. We're adding capacity to the school district. So we work hand in hand with the superintendent and his cabinet to provide additional professional development to teachers around literacy. So there's a lot of teachers out there. It is, I think the latest percentage that I heard is somewhere around 70% of the teachers in the district right now do not have a college of education background. It's, it's the highest that's ever been. So these are teachers who went to school for something else and now they're in the teaching field going through an alternative track, but they did not learn how to be a teacher in, in their college career. So these teachers need some extra support. 
And the school district doesn't have enough people to go around to these teachers' classrooms and help them become better teachers of reading. That's where we come in. We have, through our grant dollars and through donor dollars, we're able to add capacity and go into some of the highest need schools and provide professional development to those teachers on how to be better teachers of reading. And then ultimately, the, the largest program that we have is our literacy tutoring program. And this is what I'm really, really excited to tell you about. And I really hope that some of you will be inter interested enough that you'll wanna come see it. In 2019, that was right before COVID hit, we piloted this program. And this literacy tutoring program is really unique because what we do is we use, I want you to imagine a triangle, okay? We call it the trifecta. So imagine a triangle. And on the three tips of that triangle are three different people. At the top of that triangle is a student. It's a student who is having difficulty with reading. An elementary student, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, who's having difficulty with reading. At one of the bottom points of that triangle is a teenager. This is a Duval County high schooler junior or senior in high school who has been trained by us and is paid to tutor that student one-on-one -on -one several afternoons a week for 16 weeks. And then at the other point of that triangle is a reading teacher, a Duval County Public Schools teacher certified in reading who supervises several pairs of teen and elementary student. So you can imagine you walk into a room, this is after school, you walk into a room and you see a teenager with a student, a teenager with a student, a teenager with a student, and I'm a reading teacher. And I'm going around these, these teens have already been trained, but now I'm going around and I'm listening in and, and I'm coaching them, providing what some of us might call on-the-job training, right, for these teens who are helping these kids better their reading. And what part of what makes this work is, is we invested in a curriculum where the kids have choice. I'm looping it back around to what I said at the beginning. So... We invested in a curriculum that has several levels of reading going from kindergarten to fifth grade. We have fourth graders who are on a kindergarten reading level. So we're helping improve their reading quite dramatically. But every reading level has about 50, five, zero, 50 books that the kid can choose from. I don't care what book they choose. Whatever book they choose, there's going to be a, a lesson plan already written that the tutor can follow for that book, but the kid is engaged. They want to read that book. You know why? They chose it. So we have fiction and nonfiction books at every reading level. Kid chooses the book. The next day when the kid comes back to tutoring, that tutor, that team has that book ready and a lesson that they've already practiced and they're ready to tutor that kid. And then they have the support of the teacher there providing that on-the-job training, that in-the-moment coaching. So by providing that literacy tutoring, here's what we're also doing. We're providing workforce development. Most of the teens, but right now we have about 200 teens working with us across 16 schools. After, after school. So today, after school, we'll have about 200 teens providing tutoring to almost 600 kids. Each teen tutors three kids, one right after the other. And those teens are getting paid $15 an hour. Most of those teens, this is their first job. This is their first paid job. So we've partnered with AT&T. We've partnered with Career Source of North Florida. We've partnered with Vistar Credit Union. And in addition to the training and the tutoring that those teens are providing, we're providing the teens financial literacy, their first bank account, 
digital literacy, workforce skills that they're going to need. So when they graduate from high school, not if, when, that they will have the skills they need to go in whatever path they want to go to. If they want to go to a trade school, that's great. You know what? You're going to need those skills. You want to go to college? That's great too. You're going to need those skills. Some of them even say they want to become teachers. Isn't that good news? They get the, the spark, of, the love of teaching, the spark for teaching while tutoring these kids. They're going to need those skills. So the tutoring program that we have is really the culminating part of all of the, the different aspects that we think are important in learning to read, especially with kids who are having difficulty with reading. So as I close, I want to share with you, we were able, and this is something I'm going to tell you, this is unique, what I'm going to show you here. Most nonprofits don't have the opportunity to do what I'm about to show you. We were very fortunate that we had some investors that saw the, the importance of not only providing the, the programs that I told you about, but saw the importance of measuring the success in a research-based way. So we worked with professors at, a, at Ohio State University and we did a randomized control trial. What that means is, in basic terms, we had a treatment group and a control group. We had kids who got tutoring in the fall semester and kids who didn't get tutoring in the fall semester. Those kids who didn't get it, they got it in spring, so they didn't get left out. But we created a, a research study because we wanted to know exactly what is the benefit of what we're providing. And we're encouraging more nonprofits to do that. I'm leading, uh, the superintendent has asked me to lead a group uh, with literacy nonprofits in the city to do this, to encourage other nonprofits to do this very thing where we're measuring our impact so we know the return on investment. Because you know what? I tell my staff, every dollar we get is taxpayer dollars. It's either taxpayer dollars coming from local, state, or federal government or it's taxpayer dollars coming from taxpayers, right? So we treat every dollar that we get, it's a taxpayer dollar. And we wanna make sure that we are returning that investment uh, when we, on, the, on the money that we have. So here's, here's what I wanna leave you with. Here's the, oh, no. Here's the results of our randomized control trial. We had 300 kids in this study here, 150 in tutoring, 150 not in tutoring. And these were at all Title I schools. When you look at the red bars, that's the progress that the kids in tutoring made in three months. When you look at the blue bars, that's the progress the kids not in tutoring made in three months. I wanna point out two things. Uh, and these are two important messages that I want you to leave with. Number one, I want you to know that on average, our teachers are doing what we're paying them to do. You know how I know that? Because the blue bars on the whole show that with three months of instruction, the kids made three months of growth. Makes sense, right? But the kids that they're teaching are farther behind than three months. Most of these kids are one to two years behind. So we have to add more. And that's what we're able to do is to come after school and provide more instruction. So the kids that had that additional instruction in those same three months, look at how many months of growth they made. In reading accuracy, that's decoding the words on the page, eight months of growth on average in three months. That's what happens when you can add more capacity to what the teachers are doing. And look at comprehension, seven and a half months in three months. Again, that's what happens when you're able to add capacity to the school district and what those teachers are already working hard to do. So just to sum up here, Read USA, we're here to solve a problem. And that problem is low literacy and illiteracy. It's solvable. 
our we and we are going to solve that problem working together hand in hand with the school district and other partners in this community and you we've all got to come together and work take part in it in some way and when we solve that problem we're going to be able to go on and solve another problem in this city because we're going to solve this literacy problem and it's not going to be a problem anymore but we've got to take care of it now and we've got to do it now if the longer we wait the more kids are going to be behind and it's going to affect all of us in the future. So I think this is my time when I stop and ask for questions. Is that right, Joe? That would be correct. Okay. We'd like to thank you, first of all, for coming out and giving us a presentation. Could we give our speaker a round of applause? And I know for the, most of you, you can read. So are there any questions <laughs> that we would like to send that way? Oh, walk right by you. I'm so sorry. Hi, I'm Joe Everly. Uh, thanks for coming today. That's really interesting what you're doing. Uh, you mentioned at the very beginning of your of your talk about the 50% um, of the third graders are reading or reading below. Um, how does this compare with? Is Florida unique, or is this a uh, is this a national problem? When you were at Ohio State, was was this a, the same kind of a problem in Ohio as it is in Florida? It is. It's a national problem. Florida sits about right at the average when you look at the national results. And the way that we know that is, is when we look at uh, NAEP, which is the national uh, test that we give here at fourth grade, eighth grade, and 10th grade, we can see that that it is a national problem. Um, but also when you compare, there's been comparisons done because each state gives their own state test, right? Education is a state's right. So each state has their own state testing. But even when there's been comparisons done there, Florida sits about average uh, when you look at it. But nationally, it was a problem before COVID. And then of course, COVID compounded the issue. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Um, we've all heard about this book ban uh, movement over the last couple of years. Could you care to comment on that? I'd love to. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's two pieces, right? One piece is uh, when you think about the, there's four state statutes, four laws that have been enacted in the past two years that restrict or direct the way books are used in K-12 education, public education. And those four laws, uh, one of them, at least one of them, carries a felony penalty for teachers or principals who uh, break that law, break that statute. So of course, when whenever you start hearing about penalties like that, that causes panic and distress and anxiety, like, oh my goodness, am I, am, am I doing something wrong? Is this book okay? Is it, you know, am I gonna be the one wearing an orange jumpsuit? Um, but here's what I think happened uh, early on is everyone kind of panicked on, on all sides of the issue. And we got a lot of misinformation. I know it's hard for you to believe that misinformation would be out there, but it, it was out there. And I think the misinformation was on both sides. There was some misinformation uh, in how many books school districts were actually banning, right? So for instance, in Duval County Public Schools, there's only 13 books, and you can go on DCPS website and see this, there's only 13 books in the entire library system of the public school system in Jacksonville, Florida, 13 books that have been pulled completely from use in the schools, 13. Now, I've heard people talking, uh, you know, in various articles or whatever and saying thousands of books or whatever, and that's just not true. So have there been books banned? Yes, there have. Is it the number of books that we are hearing? Not necessarily. Now, I'm speaking for Duval County Public Schools. This is a county by county uh, process, right? You go to Clay County, that's a completely different story. They've made national news for the number of books that they've pulled out of their system, right? So in Duval County, what's actually happened is, is while they've, all, they've 
pooled 13 books, they've reallocated hundreds of books saying, based on the new laws, this book may no longer be okay for kindergarten to eighth grade. It might be fourth to eighth grade. So they have restricted the grade levels based on the laws. That's what we're seeing more <laughs> in Duval County, less banning and more grade level band adjustments. Um, let, let me segue the, uh, into you talk about different grades. And I was looking a little bit at, you, at your data you have in here <laughs> for the, the go test or grove test or gorg test. Okay. Um, do you find after you identify a student that needs assistance and you get them in there, is there a more of an impact in a particular grade than other grades? It looks like just on what you published in here, fourth grade seems to be kind of the, the prime grade you get a lot of results out of when you intervene as, instead of second, third, or even fifth. Is that what you see the data, certain sweet spots where you intervene? Absolutely. You found that pretty quick. Are you looking for a job? Because we, we, we might be hiring a data person. I'm just kidding. No, you're exactly right. Fourth grade is our sweet spot and English language learners are our sweet spot. So we're making progress with all grade levels, but for, and we don't quite know why. I have some ideas of why I think fourth grade might be the, the spot. Um, one being is because fourth grade is tested on reading and writing, where third and fifth are reading only. And we provide reading and writing instruction. I don't. I don't know. Um, but English language learners is another one. When we separate out demographics, they they seem to uh, do better than other subgroups. Yes. Um, you <laughs> talked about um, getting those results over that period of time. Have you done any long term studies to see what happens four years later if they're still maintaining, eight years later, and that sort of thing? Right. So the short answer is no, we haven't done anything that long. We've done a year long study. So we just had the, the um, reports come back to us for a year long study. The difficulty is, is it's hard to track students. So we are working in certain elementary schools and we're working in Title I elementary schools in the most underserved uh, areas of the city. There's a lot of movement in those neighborhoods. So it would, it can be done. We need to make, we would have to make another investment in tracking kids more long-term with that uh, to follow back up with them and find out what school are they at now? Are they still in one that we're serving? Are they in a different one? Um, so, so the answer is the longest we've tracked is one year. We have time for two more questions, and here's one of them. Go ahead. Thank you so much for what you're doing. This is fascinating, and it, thank you for what you're doing. My question is simple. What do you need from us as a club and as individuals? So, of course, the number one thing that we need is funding, right? But the, let me tell you the way, when I think about funding, here's really what we need. We need... Uh, we have three different buckets, so to speak. We need some funding to help us sustain what we're doing right now. Um, a lot of people, as you know, uh, with with uh, the economics that, that we have right now, uh, funding has been cut not only in the school district, but a lot of grants that we rely on have been reduced. Uh, the, do number, the dollars that we get through those grants have been reduced. So we need uh, some unrestricted funds to maintain what we have now. But what we also want to do is we want to leverage those funds with federal grants. We are in AmeriCorps. I don't know if anybody's heard of AmeriCorps. It's kind of like Peace Corps, but it's, a, it's within the United States, and it's a service-oriented uh, federal initiative. And we get federal dollars for AmeriCorps, meaning that a lot of our teens are AmeriCorps service members. And in addition to getting paid, they get an education stipend. They, they get additional uh, benefits for being an AmeriCorps member. But AmeriCorps requires that those dollars be matched. So we're looking, we're, when I talk to, to investors or for people about funding, I say it's not just 
giving us money. It's really matching or leveraging the dollars we're getting. So to get more AmeriCorps money, we need more dollars to match to it. So that's one thing. The other thing I would say is, is, is being an advocate. Um, you know, we, we are, you all are, are connected to other business leaders and, and other organizations like civic, civic council, things like that. Uh, letting them know uh, what organizations like Read USA are doing and that there is a need. Uh, and I would say, let's follow the data. Let look at the organizations that have data that say, here's, here's data that shows that we are using your dollars wisely and impacting the community. Um, so, so the funding need is there, but also that advocacy need and bringing others to, uh, to, to know about what the work we're doing. Yeah. One last question. Okay, yes, sir. Thank you, Rob, for being here and for what the organization is doing. Can you comment on the status of pre-K education and particularly related to literacy? And is that an area that Free USA would like to work in and has thought about working in? So I'll, the second part I'll answer first. Have we thought about working there? We've tried to, uh, using this tutoring model with first grade and it didn't work so well because the closer we get down to, or the, the younger the kid, the more expertise the person needs and the, it, the teens, it was harder to provide them the support to, to make that happen. So I don't think this is the model that works for that as far as tutoring but our teacher professional development reaches them. So we've done work with like John Love Elementary, or well, it was John Love Elementary, we're not taught there, John Love Early Learning Center, which is a pre-K center, um, providing professional development to the teachers on what early learning skills and strategies look like. But to go back to your point about pre-K, um, the biggest uh, message that I have about pre-K is, is when you look at the district-led pre-Ks, there are elementary schools that have pre-K classrooms at their schools. Those students that finish pre-K in Duval County Public Schools finish very high. And it's measured by a kindergarten readiness test. And I think it's something like 90%, 92% are kindergarten ready when they leave Duval County Public Schools pre-K. What we also have, though, is we have uh, child care providers okay. offering pre-K. So when we started VPK, you can get state funding as a child care provider. Uh, let's say you have your own daycare center, you can get funding for that and provide VPK yourself. The numbers of, or, or the kindergarten readiness of children coming out of child care center VPKs is much lower, something like in the 50s or 60s percent versus the 90 for the school district. So that's something that I know the Early Learning Coalition and Kids Hope Alliance, people like that, are looking at to say, how can we, we really need a little bit tighter rein on the private and child care based VPKs, um, so that because we want to bring that level of kindergarten readiness up to what we're seeing in our public schools right now. Dr. Robert Kelly, Read USA. Uh, does it matter what media they're reading? I mean, we talked a lot about mm. books, but are they using tablets and other things to uh, to teach children how to read? So we use paper books um, for young children learning to read. We find that that is most effective, and the and there's research out there to still show that for young children learning to read books are still effective. Part of that has to do with the way our brain works mm -hmm. and the way our memory works, right? Has, have any of you ever go ever said, I can visualize this on that page right. at the top right there, right? Easy to do when it's a book, harder to do if you're lost in some website or, or digital resource, right? Awesome. Right, so for young children, we still use paper mm -hmm. books. As they get older, the research starts to get blurred where it may not make a difference. And before you go, you've got these red booklets on the table. Encourage our members to take those with them and tell them what's inside. Absolutely. So in the red folders, you have some one-pagers that tell about the different programs that we have and the outcomes of those programs. 
So you'll see a summary of our literacy tutoring program, our book choice and ownership program, workforce development that I talked to you about. And then you'll see uh, our latest data report, um, a one pager about just the organization as a whole. So um, bits of information. So if there was something that you're interested in, you can pull that one piece out and that gives you the summary of that information. And last plug, uh, we're in 16 elementary schools right now providing tutoring. I'm gonna tell you, you know, I've been a teacher for over 20 years and, and teachers are great, but to see these young people working with these kids and the impact they're making is pretty incredible. I would, anybody who wants to come out and see tutoring, there's a school near you that we're tutoring at. I have business cards here. You can contact me. I'd love for you to come out and see it in person. Dr. Robert Kelly, thank, thank you. you for coming. <laughs> We're at the end of today's lunch and meeting. I've got a, a few final announcements to give to you. Uh, huh? Pretty good. <laughs> so remember, next week there's no meeting. It's our service week. Get out there and help your neighbors, those that have been impacted by uh, the storm, uh, Milton, get back on their feet. Remember to donate some money. We will make a donation vis-a-vis -vis the district from the funds that we raise. I want you to join me in thanking our banquet manager, Tiffany, and the service staff at Timaquana Country Club. Both Katie Quackenbush and Ed Lombard were our greeters today. I want to also thank uh, Matt Hebner and Palmer Bell and uh, 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 um, that lady, where's she at? Alberta Hips. <laughs> it's not here, so. <laughs> Alberta Hips for stepping in today and, uh, and pinch hitting on behalf of, uh, of, uh, of Scott, I guess. And then we got some future meetings coming up. Again, no lunch meeting next week. On the 30th, we'll be back here with Riverside uh, Club for our annual Florida Georgia luncheon. Um, and then lastly, today, our four-way test is going to be, uh, is going to be uh, presented by uh, Jim Schumacher. Jim, how about standing up and Question. leading us in the four-way? That's a great idea. Um, can I wear Steelers gear for the yeah. Florida Georgia? One or the other. We ought to dress for the Florida Georgia game. Anybody who's got it should wear it. It'll be a fun time. We'll be here. All right, Jim, you want to lead us in the four-way? <laughs> That we made a four way test for things we think they or do. Number one, is this the crew? Two, is the very officer? Three, will it build the crew? Four, will it officer? Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Hey, and before we go, uh, Patty wanted me to remind you that we've got a new credit card platform that you'll see on the upcoming bills. You'll have the opportunity to pay these uh, via credit card or an ACH debit. There will be a small fee for that convenience. It's called Team Merchant. Let's get out there and make some magic. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Where I uh, went through that whole thing. Uh, that is his thumb drive. Ready to get wheels. One time, you took him again.